now it's time for that gets my goat. Is that okay, Bob? Hi, everybody. This is Big Anglovich. And this is Rishi Outfield, and this is That Gets My Goat. That's right. We went and uh, saw a film this week. I think maybe some of you guys also saw this film. I know uh, for a fact that some people did. The film was... The Nut Job! Yay! Oh, it was brilliant. <clears throat> uh, no, no, it's Captain America colon the Winter Soldier. And the powers of heaven and hell conspired to make it so we couldn't go see it. Uh, and somehow we did anyway. Yeah, can I tell my story about that? Oh, certainly. Let me see. i got I got to make sure I get all the elements in there. Let me try and collect my thoughts here. We planned to go and see it on the Friday that it opened. Uh, I figured we would probably need late tickets because I'd need to get all the kids settled and put the baby to bed and, and all that kind of stuff before I could head out. And as I was getting the tickets, I was talking to my wife and she was saying that she had to leave for work at a particular time. And so then I had to kind of adjust the showing and I thought, oh, maybe I better get the one that's a half hour earlier than the, than the actual last show. And so uh, I switched it up to that. I came home with these tickets. I went to the theater on my way home, bought the tickets. I had them in my wallet, ready to go. And uh, yeah, then I came home. And first thing I did when I got home was I had to pick up my daughter from a birthday party that she had gone to. It was a pirate-themed birthday party, and they had a treasure map as the uh, invitation. <laughs> you followed the, you know, went until you got to the X, and that was it. Anyways, I went and picked her up. She comes out the door with like two cupcakes in her hand, and I guess they watched a movie, so they told them to bring pillows if they wanted to. So she had like her pillows. She had all this stuff. She had a bag that was chock full of like treats that she was bringing home. It had candy, and I think she had at least two sodas stuffed into this thing. And uh, her, I gave her and her friend a ride home, and they were just like, oh, that was the best birthday party ever. Oh, it was so awesome. Yeah, they were really going off about this birthday party, but <clears throat> we'll find out more about how awesome this birthday party was later. Will we? They told us we had 20 minutes to record in here. We came into the, uh, the the library, and they said, oh, we're closing in 20 minutes, but you can use the room until then. And then they couldn't find the keys to let us <laughs> in here. So they said, oh, you'll have to go talk to somebody else. And so we went to talk to somebody else. She's like, oh, yes, but hey, we're closing in 18 minutes. <laughs> Oh, I can't find the right key. Okay, yeah, weird. I, I open this door every single time. This key isn't it. It's like, okay, you guys have 15 minutes. <laughs> it was like some comedy thing. Where it's just like, oh, okay. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe after we're kicked out, we may have to finish this outside. To, but yeah, we will hear more about it. But yeah, that was the first thing I did was pick up my daughter. I brought her home, and my other daughter had some friends over. So they all started playing, and uh, they were having a grand old time. The evening went on. I thought, okay, I got to get the baby to sleep so that I can get there at just the right time. And I went and I took him in and I started putting him to bed. And I think you called me right in the middle of that. And I had to quickly silence the phone so that he would stay asleep. But I managed to get him to sleep. I put him in his bed. And the second I let go of him, no, 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 he starts crying. So I picked him back up and I held him in front of his bed until he went more to sleep. And then... Uh, I went to put him down again, and he started crying again. And so I picked him back up, and I held him for a longer. I sat back down on the rocking chair and uh, waited until he was good and asleep this time. And uh, just to save my wife the effort, I took him into our room and put him right into our bed. That way she wouldn't have to wake up an hour later when he woke up and bring him back into her bed because that's what he winds up doing every friggin' day. So I put him in bed with her, and then I went downstairs, and my, my daughter's friends were still there. It was like, our showing was what, 10, 10? I believe so. These kids, uh, I asked them before I went to put the baby to sleep, hey, your mom's coming to get you, right? And what time's she coming? And they said, ah, I don't know, 9-ish. It was like 9.35, 940, something like that. Their mom still hadn't shown up. And I went to talk to them, and they're like, yeah, my mom will come. And I'm like, okay. 
We'll make sure that you guys are quiet and don't wake mom up because she has to get up very early in the morning to go to work. And so I headed out. And I was heading to meet you. And I was five minutes down the road. And I was talking to you on the phone as as it happened. And my wife called. But, but let me oh, interrupt. Okay. While, while you called me, you said, I know what's going to happen. The parents <laughs> are going to come to pick up these girls. And the girls are going to have music on or TV on or they're going to be downstairs and they won't hear. And the parents will knock. And finally, they'll ring the doorbell. It'll wake my wife up or wake the baby up or wake both of them up. And they'll have to go down to answer the door. And, you know, it will undermine all of the good that I managed with putting the baby to sleep in the morning. Yeah, I, I expected that would probably be what happened because they still hadn't shown up. I mean, it was 945. But, yeah, the phone rings. And I'm like, oh, crap, there's the phone. And I click over to answer it, and it's my wife, and she says, yeah, the girl's sister called and said that their mom's not home and that they need to be home right now. And so I had to turn around and go back and pick them up and take them to their house. So I do this. I turn around. I'm like, damn it. And on top of that, my wife says, oh, and by the way, you gave me an awake baby, not a sleeping baby. You put him in bed, and the second you turned around, he sat up and said, Hi, Mom! And I was just like, <laughs> So you called me and said, We're not going to be able to go in there. Yeah, I didn't um, think I was going to. And, and by this point, I was almost there. You know, I, I'm about a half hour, 40 minutes away from this theater. And I was like, Dude, it's only two more blocks. You really want me to turn around? I mean, sorry, two more exits. And you said, uh, I'll, I'll call you. Just don't, don't turn around. Whoa, oh, the commissar's in town. That's right. You don't want to turn around with the commissar in town. No, you know, you said, uh, don't turn around. I'll see what happens and I'll call you, right? Is that? Yeah, the faster you live, the faster you will die. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I told, I told you that maybe you might wind up just having to get a ticket and watching it by yourself. Because that's the worst part, too, is I had two tickets in my wallet. I couldn't give them to you. There was no way for me to get them to you because I'd have to. I mean, sometimes if you get there first with the tickets, you can leave them with the ticket seller guy, the person yeah. behind the little glass window, and they'll give them to you. But I couldn't do that because I was the one that wasn't going to make it there. You were getting there first. I had the ticket, so we were totally screwed. Well, see, I had this scheme that maybe I could convince the guy <laughs> to let me in, even if I had to put you on the phone and you're like, hey, these are our two seats. Because it's one of those theaters where you pick the seat that's before him. Right. And if he didn't go for that, then I would buy a ticket. You know, I, if it was full, I would buy a really crappy seat ticket. But I would go sit down in one of the good seats that you had picked up earlier in the day, just waiting for you to get there, and I'd fill you in once the movie started. Right. Uh, so anyways, I head back to the house. I pull into our driveway, and guess who pulls into our driveway directly behind me? Josh Groban. The parent of the, the yes, the parent of these girls who was coming to pick them up. Now I don't know what happened. Why the older sister decided she needed to call and tell them to come home? She obviously didn't know what was going on. The mom was meaning to come and pick up the other girls as soon as she got home to do so. And uh, yeah, so a I didn't really need to come home. Because those girls didn't need a ride after all. they Their ride was on the way and it got there exactly the same time that I did. But your wife had said, you didn't give me a sleeping baby. You gave me a woken up baby. Damn that's, your eyes. <laughs> that's true. And so I went upstairs to get the baby and she's like, oh no, you can leave him here. It's okay. No. And she f actually fought me to keep possession of this baby, which... I'm pretty sure it was just her being like, eh, you should have given me a sleeping baby and now I'm going to fight you because I'm going to be a martyr. Or I don't know, you know, we sometimes you get that way. People do that kind of crap. And I think that was what she was doing. And I basically wrestled the baby <laughs> out of her grip. And I was just like, okay, now what do I do? I'm just going to bring the baby with me. And, uh... Obviously, he doesn't want to sleep, so he can just come with me, and eventually, sometime in the middle of the movie, he'll fall asleep, and I'll just hold him while the movie's on. And uh, so I went back downstairs, and I helped those the two girls that were there out to to say goodbye with their, you know, to go with their mom. They got in their car, they started driving away. I got the baby into his car seat, and uh, 
I went to pull out, and then all of a sudden the mom was back. And one of the girls gets out of the car, oh, I forgot something, and so she runs, and I had to go and unlock the door for her and let her back into the house so that she could go get the bag that she forgot at the house, go get back out of her car. And so, yeah, I'm getting in the car, and I want to say it was 10 o'clock when I got in the car. The show starts at 10.10. No, it was probably 10.05 when <laughs> I got in the car. 10 o'clock is w- would be too likely for me to make it on time. I got in the car, and it was at least a 15-minute drive, I think, to this theater that I was going to. And so I got in the car, and I tore out of there. I was probably going well over the speed limit of every road that I was on the entire trip. There. With a sleeping or awake baby? He was awake. He sat there in the back and was just looking around. And I was surprised because I figured 15 minutes in the car, if nothing else, would probably put him to sleep, and that would be it. And... Uh, yeah, I drove as fast as I could. Uh, I got there. You, I called you, or maybe you called me, and we're asking what. Okay, so yes, sorry, we're, we're cutting back. <laughs> you get half the story, and I get to half the story. So okay, so meanwhile, I got to the theater, and I've only been to this theater like three other times, and two of the three other times I've parked in the wrong place, and this was one of those cases where they have a marquee, and so I always think, well, that's where you park. You know, the big sign that says what the well, it used to say what the show times are. Now it says reserve a theater and marriages between a man and a woman. You know, it has these these these, <laughs> these advertising slogans on it. And so I parked there, and, well, then, I, and also, then I was like, shoot, how do I get in? Because there was a door right there, which is the door I used to go into the theater through when the theater first opened. Right. But it was... only opens from one side, the inside. It's an exit now, and so I was like, oh, shoot. Yeah, I was going to say, where you parked, the theater had been recently remodeled, and they basically flipped it. So the side that you used to go in used to be the front door is now just like the back, and the front door is totally the other side. So I think that's why you always park on the other side, is that's where you used to, supposed to go in, but now yeah, that's see, just that a, theater is dumpster. far from where I live, and so the only times I ever go to it is when you are meeting me. Right. And you're coming from work or coming from home or something. And so uh, I started walking and all the doors were cl- were locked because these were all exit doors only. And finally, I found one that was unlocked and walked in and there was the theater, uh, not the theater, but the, the, the screening room, whatever you want, the actual You were in place. the back hall beyond the ticket taker. And I realized, you know, I probably don't need to beg the guy to let me in. I don't need to buy a third ticket. I can just go and sit down and watch the movie for free. Why doesn't everyone do this? <laughs> uh, seriously, that's the first thing that came to my mind is like, I haven't seen Noah. I haven't seen, you know, it's like, I can see all these movies for free now. I haven't seen Divergent, my favorite movie. Right. So I called you and said, hey, here's the deal. You know, I just tell me what the, the-, the seats are and I'll sit there and you don't have to worry about giving me a ticket because I'm already in the theater. And you said, oh, I'm on my way. I'm, I'm, I'm driving. I've got the baby. I'm going to be there. You know, just sit down and I'll, I'll find you soon. And so that was cool. And uh, I don't know. There must have been a buttload of commercials and trailers because you missed nothing, correct? I did. it. Yeah, I made it there. I was there by 1020, I would say, which I guess works for the 15-minute drive and the 1005 leaving time. But yeah, 1020 I got there. I don't know how many trailers I missed. I actually saw some trailers, too, when I got there. There were still trailers left. I don't remember what they were, uh, so they weren't memorable, I guess. But uh, I saw one and a half, maybe, trailers when I got there. And, yeah, then the movie started up. I didn't miss a thing, which was awesome. And, yeah, my my son sat there on, on my lap the whole time. He would not go to sleep. I was just completely and thoroughly amazed by this but at the same time he just sat there and watched the movie and said captain america about 900 times <laughs> yeah but he didn't run all around he didn't cry he didn't kick the seat or any of the stuff that kids that, which is a reason we don't want kids right in our our movies for grown-ups yeah he was very well behaved but yeah i was just amazed that he made it he i think he fell asleep about 20 minutes before the movie ended <laughs> Which is just insane, because that would have been, like, midnight or later. I don't know what, like, if they gave him, like, a five-hour nap 
earlier in the day or what the heck the deal was, but he just would not sleep. Maybe the movie was just so good. He's just like, whoa, Captain America, yeah. He did say that a few times. <laughs> but yeah, every time he would see Captain America, he would point his finger and say, Captain America, which I thought was pretty fun. He even did it I'm, sometimes for like Black Widow when she was kicking butt. He, he, you know, It's hard to tell the difference, somebody in a black suit. Because Captain America was wearing a black suit for a large portion of it. He had like this black, like stealth Captain America suit or whatever. Still had like the little star and like a stripe across the front, but the rest of it was black. That was interesting. But uh, but yeah, he, he was he had a good time and uh, stayed awake for most of it. It was surprising because even way into the movie when I thought, okay, he's definitely asleep by now. And then like a big explosion happens and he goes, whoa. <laughs> he did do that. Another thing that was interesting was this is the theater where you and I saw Battleship. Oh, right. And they actually had those D-Box seats in, directly in the row in front of us. Yeah. And so a couple of times, I was just like, what the hell is going on? Because the, <laughs> the room would rumble and this, you know, I just assumed that the person in front of me had leaned forward and that's why the seat had moved. <laughs> but then later I realized, oh, these seats in front of ours are moving of their own accord. Yeah. Yeah. Spoiler alert. I don't know if this counts as a spoiler, but Falcon was in this film. And yeah, the part where we really noticed it is when Falcon starts flying around and doing all his stuff. And then you see like the all the banks of seats like going back and forth and around and up and down. And yeah, you tapped me on the arm and pointed at him. And I was like, oh, it's the D-bag seats. But that was like 80 minutes into the movie before yeah. I even realized, yeah, that's what was I, going on. For a second, I wondered what the deal was too because there was one time where there was like an explosion or something and my my seat shook mine did too yeah. and i was like oh oh looks like our time is up to be continued okay so we're back We've been thrust from the library study room and we're now out in the park and the wind is kind of chilly it is cold yeah i'm gonna hold my hand up and see if we can save our sound less wind noise we do have a wind sock but I don't know if that will make enough difference. So I'll just try and keep my hand here. So anyways, yeah, we watched the movie. That was where we were at, right? I think we were about to talk about the movie, right? Yeah, I think we're ready to. We, we made it to the theater. We saw the D-bag seats, and <laughs> we gave a spoiler. We're gonna, uh, we'll give you another spoiler warning just for anybody who has not seen this movie. We will talk about the movie. Uh, deep. We'll talk deep into the movie, probably. So... We may spoil some things for you, so if you mean to see the film, you should see it first and then listen after. But that should go without saying on everything. Uh, so anyhow, uh, it's only been three years since the first Captain America, less than three years since the first Captain America, less than two years since the Avengers. Um, and uh, I don't know whether we should talk about the movie as a whole or whether we should just start with little things that you liked or didn't like. Uh, but, but my major, the thing that I came away from it was, wow, this movie was for adults. You know, it's strange that Marvel would choose to make a grown-up movie, a like a political thriller, rather than, you know, just an action-adventure flick or, or whatever. Would be the easy thing to do to draw the attention of kids and, and teenagers. Uh, the movie seemed grown-up to me, you know, about what is right and what is wrong the different shades of gray and who can you trust and, and you know what does a good guy mean nowadays and a commentary on post 9-11 America obviously um, that's kind of Captain America's shtick sort of though because he's the man out of time you know he came from that different era the simpler era where you know guys with the skulls on their uniforms were the bad guys the guys with the black uniforms and the lightning bolts were the bad guys, but the uh, regular old GIs were obviously the good guys kind of a thing, you know, and then all of a sudden he wakes up in the future and everything's different. And he has this, what you know, the, the, the crisis within all the time about just who... Who is he serving? Is he doing the right thing anymore, being Captain America? Because America was, you know, when he first came back, it was, you know, the Vietnam War and, and stuff like that. And there was all the, the 
political turmoil and didn't wasn't I mean I I think I read this somewhere I don't know because I'm not uh, an expert in comics and especially from 30 years ago but wasn't there a time where like Captain America like gave up his Captain America mantle or whatever you want to call it and became like the masked Avenger the 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 I don't know what. Did yeah, see, I'm, I'm not an expert on Captain America either, but there have been several periods where he's relinquished the title and somebody else stepped in or he's become like a vigilante instead yeah. because of something he didn't agree with that the government was doing or because, you know, there was a corrupt person in power that made, you know, it difficult for him to be Captain America and all that stuff. And so, yeah, it's not something that is new, but. Captain America seems like a new character just because we haven't right. seen him all that much. And yeah, but I, I, it wasn't necessarily America was what was bad. It was S.H.I.E.L.D., this organization that he served. I mean, it, did they even say the A word once in that whole movie? I don't think so. Um, and yeah, Black Widow certainly acted like she was not an Avenger. She was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Uh huh. And so uh, that just surprised me that they. You know, there was an issue of can you trust Nick Fury? Can you trust Natasha or Natalia, whichever name you subscribe to? And I just thought, but she's an Avenger. Of course you can trust her. I mean, it's like she put her life on the line the same as you, but they never mentioned that. And I thought, well, that's that's an interesting way to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, I liked seeing those two together. I mean, they, they gave Black Widow a ton to do in this movie. Yeah. And they went out of their way to say, okay, you know, she represents Shades of Grey and the modern world and all that stuff that, that, that Steve Rogers has a hard time getting behind. She doesn't question orders. Uh, and and if, some, if they ask her to do something that is morally wrong, she does it. Whereas he, uh, and, and, and you know, that's sort of strange because Cap, coming from a military background, you'd think he's the one that would not question orders. He's the one that would be like, yes, sir. And, and he would uh, salute and then go do it. But they chose to say, okay, no, this guy leads, does everything by the mandates of his conscience and of his heart and his head and all that stuff. And he, well, that's, that's, I just saw the first Captain America movie very recently. Oh, I haven't seen it. And so yeah. that's one of the things that they went on and on about. You know, they had the scientist guy. You know, he was choosing the guy to be Captain America, and he kept talking about your heart is what matters. You know, we can change your body. And, you know, he was the weakest and the, the worst of all the soldiers. But, you know, he knew what was right and wrong, and he wouldn't, you know, put up for bullies, and he wouldn't, you know... Uh, stand for that and even when the scientist gets killed by the uh, Hydra agent right after Captain America is created that's what he does you know Captain America comes over and he's leaning over him and he touches his heart and says you, you know he doesn't say anything he touches his heart and then he dies <laughs> but uh, you know his, his last basic message I guess you can't say it's his last words but his last message to Captain America is remember this is what matters most so seems like it's carrying So that's through. consistent. And yeah, I believe the, the writers of Winter Soldier are the same guys who wrote the first Captain America. Uh, but we had a different pair of directors. Kenneth Branagh, wait, no, he did Thor. Joe Johnston didn't have anything to do with this one. Um, and it makes me wonder, did they even ask him back? I, I don't know. But it had a very different feel to me than the first movie. And I don't know, I haven't seen it since the theater, so I Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it does feel consistent to it. But well, it felt very different just because it's set in a completely different time. You know what I mean? It's it's hard for it to feel the same when the whole first movie took place in the forties, and there was only just the bookend stuff where they hey, we found Captain America and and then he runs out onto Times Square because apparently Shield keeps a special recovery ward right on Times Square. <laughs> it, kind of dumb, but it's the easiest way for them to show you, hey, this is modern world now. Visually, that's... I, I can't think of another place in America where that's... You know, where where you can see the modern or the future 
you know, every place in Japan looks like Times Square. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, if it had been the 80s, there would have been tons of porno theaters and hookers and all that stuff, you know. And now it's just <laughs> signs and neon and giant buildings. Giant and, screens. Yeah. What was I saying? I was saying something. I was going somewhere before well, we were that. Just saying the, the oh, the feel, films, right. right? Yeah, they 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 did feel very different, and yeah, there were different styles of movie. I guess, like you were saying, this one's like a political thriller or something. It feels much more like a. Uh, I'm not sure what to compare it to. Well, they don't make movies like that anymore. But it I feels was, like a 70s Day of the Condor kind yeah, of Yeah, I was going to say something like that, All the President's Men or something, uh, kind of a film where, yeah, it, it's all about the government, the agency, who's, you know, who can you trust? Yeah, I, I guess it's kind of maybe a James Bondish uh, feel to it, but... Uh, but yeah, it was definitely a, a different... One, one thing that I thought was interesting and kind of s sad, I guess, maybe strange, you could say, too, but the music was completely different. They did not bring back the Captain America theme that they established in the, uh, in the first movie. They didn't play it a lot in the first movie, which I thought was kind of a mistake, to tell you the truth, because if you got a good theme, play it enough times that people can recognize it, you know what I mean? Something that when people walk out of the theater, they'll whistle that to themselves as they go because they heard it ten times during the movie and they're hearing it in the end credits as they leave. Well, I think we talked about that. That had to have been a conscious decision. We want this movie to feel different than the other movies, but we don't want to evoke any of the... 40s patriotism, America good, yay, any of that stuff. I, because there's that moment in the Avengers when they're on the helicarrier and Cap goes into action and that Alan Silvestri music plays. I and think so, yeah. I think I remember that. And and it's it, Sylvester it was the composer. Was Sylvester the composer for this Captain America film? No, no, this one was... It's a totally uh, different guy. I don't know what the deal is with that. And maybe... Maybe that's a thing in Hollywood now, like that it's maybe they all think it's lame to have a theme that you go back to again and again and again or something. I'm not sure what the deal is with it. Well, um, see, that's too bad because somebody five or six or seven years from now will do it again, like John Williams used to do, and people are going to be like, holy cow, wasn't that cool when. But that should never go away. Yeah, I don't understand it, but it's kind of gone away with all, like Avengers, that did have a theme, but they hardly played it in the film. You would hear it one time, it would like, you know, that it would you, play beginning you to hear end and it, it would when stop. when you put the DVD in and the menu. Uh, right. <laughs> and it was just, and all those, you know, like Hulk, there's been several Hulk movies. They don't, they haven't made a theme for Hulk yet. Iron Man. God, that is they, so loud. They have a sort of theme for Iron Man. And you claim that it came back. I've never heard it come they back. They did have it in the second film. I did notice it, but I don't remember from the third film, and I haven't seen that since the theater, so I don't know if they did have it. But it's just frustrating to me, somebody who was raised in the age of Star Wars and Indiana Jones and uh, Superman and, you know, the ones that... And even the Batman movies that we were the raised Elfman. on the Elfman ones they had that theme and they played it and they played it and they kept coming back to it and it's sad to me um, when we finished watching the film we walked out into the parking lot and you got a text from Marshall Latham I did yes I wanted to mention that I probably have more Parsec nominations than I have friends <laughs> and Marshall texted me that he and his family had just gone to see Captain America like we were friends and I was just like wow <laughs> that is awesome man I, I don't know it, for some reason it meant it's meant something to me that he would send me a text but yeah Marshall Latham texted you when we walked out into the parking lot and he said that Captain America he really liked he compared it to this one is to the first Captain America like catching fire is to the first Hunger Games and I don't know if it was worth bothering with but after that text, I figured, you know what, I'm going to need to see Catching Fire. And so I rented it. We watched it Sunday. And as an example of soundtrack stuff, in the first Hunger Games, there was one little theme 
that you recognize. It's the part where they come in on their chariots and the big the music swells. Dun 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 dun. dun they, you know, as they come in, and it's the only time you hear it. I actually downloaded the soundtrack and I listened <laughs> to it through, and I'm like, crap! That's the only time it actually played. All the rest of the stuff, ne- it's all just like mood well, music. The rest of the whole movie. There was that damned whistle that was yeah. in all the ad campaigns for the Hunger Games or whatever. And when I saw the second one, it was absent until the title shows up at the end of the movie. <laughs> but uh, in the second Hunger Games, in Catching Fire, they played that theme up 50 times. Did I they? Don't, they played it a ton. And I thought, oh, they learned. They're using this all the time. Like every time somebody, you know, the the, the when they all went in on their chariots, again, they played it. When, uh, you know, any Hunger Game related stuff would go, this theme would go. When the people's pictures appeared in the sky they would play that music and i thought oh at last somebody's learned and they're making uh you know a something effort to yeah an effort to brand this music in as the hunger games music so people will remember it um, we could do a whole episode about what the filmmakers behind catching fire must have learned from <laughs> hunger games i do not i'm serious i've seen thousands of movies i do not remember a movie where the sequel was that significantly better than the original like they had said okay this didn't work this didn't work this didn't work we're losing all that stuff these things work we're gonna make the whole movie that i i can't even i'm trying to think of a movie like that and nothing is coming to mind yeah so i I checked that out just to see the comparison because i think after you got that text i said yeah i could i'd probably say this is like thor 2 and thor 1 you know the difference to those two and you're like nah Thor one was way worse than Captain. It America was. One. I I thought Captain Cap, <laughs> until Avengers came out, Captain America was my favorite of the uh, Marvel Studios toys. So sorry, get, getting back to where we were, the the feel of the okay, movie, but you the saw music, Catching Fire. I did because of Marsha's tag. Yes, and I just I figured I'd mention it now because I was talking about the music and I wanted mm. to mention how they had learned the lesson also of using the music that was good, which Captain America unfortunately didn't learn. And it seems like Marvel Studios just never does that for some reason. They got a thing against it, which bothers me. I I would like to be able to get the next soundtrack to the sequel and hear, you know, basically a new variations on the, the theme. It's like, you know, the in classical music they get that, where they just take variations on a theme by whoever, and some other composer will take somebody's thing and, and do new variations, and it's neat to hear. Um, well, I don't know who made the decision in Avengers. Let's just give the credit to Josh Whedon because I like the guy. But they certainly did that with in Avengers, where it's like, okay, we we can play Cap's theme right here, and Thor two had the themes from Thor one in it, but it was the same composer. Right. Um, so that might be part of the deal. I'm sad that they haven't done that because, especially in a movie like the Avengers, where it's actually a sequel to four or five other movies. <laughs> right you could port over the themes of the Hulk and here's the music that played the first time Black Widow flipped a guy in the hall, you know, kind of thing. That, right. All that stuff would just be really cool. And yeah, this was a dark movie and a pessimistic movie and a violent movie and all that stuff, but there were still a couple of triumphant moments with Captain America where you could have used that theme, the good right. old theme. Yeah, there was a few. You know, like the part where, and you see this in the uh, trailer even, but all the guys get onto the elevator and he realizes that they're bad guys. And he says, before we start, any of you guys want to get off? <laughs> that's and they don't get my off. my favorite part of the whole movie is that, that sequence. And then he beats them all down and then he's standing there in the elevator and everybody's down and perfect time. He kicks the shield and it flips up into his hand. Yeah, oh, perfect God. time for something like that. And there's plenty of other times as well, but... But yeah, it's uh, it, it's kind of a shame that they didn't do that. But you know, that's not the main uh, thing we need to talk about <laughs> with this film. Um, should we do uh, overall? Did you really like this film? Oh, I did. I I think it was a little dour. Mm-hmm. But I I found it refreshingly adult. Like I said, I didn't feel like I was being talked down to. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, and, and with a movie like that, where there are com- complexities and layers, maybe it will lend itself to repeated viewing. 
Um, but at the same time, I could see a lot of kids saying, no, that movie was boring, and I, I didn't like it. There was way too much talking, or it was too long, kind of thing. And Not enough an explosions. Why are they just talking, all this talking? I guess that's and possible. That's something I complain about the movie business all the time, that the only people they care about are 13-year-old boys. And, and there is a segment of Hollywood that also cares about 13-year-old girls. Well, I, w- I will give them that much rope to hang themselves with. But uh, I think that the Russo brothers, the, the, the guys that directed this movie, were like, you know, if the 13-year-old boys are mature enough to handle it, I, I hope they enjoy it. But we're making a movie, a movie for grown Yeah, I definitely felt that way. It was dour, but it wasn't dour like... The Pursuit of Happiness was dour, (laughs) for example. Yeah, it was a dark story, and it seemed like things were always going wrong, and things were... Yeah, I mean, they had some surprising things. Like, here's spoiler number one. Nick Fury is shot to death (laughs) in this film. Um, Spoiler number two, he wasn't really, but... uh, (laughs) but Anti-spoiler. They they make you believe... That Nick Fury is shot to death. He's dead. He gets shot to death right in front of Captain America. They let him die. That was another really good scene. Uh, I mean, it was an extended action scene of let's get Nick Fury. Oh, yeah. And I I liked it because they didn't just keep doing the same damn thing. They, they would attack him in one way, and then they would send something else to attack him in a different way. And then, you know they're going to run him off the road and then they're going to shoot him and then finally the winter soldier shows up and he's just a, like a terminator type dude yeah and uh, that stuff was really cool i mean as morally ambiguous as nick fury was i you know we didn't want him to get killed and then he shows up at captain america's apartment and you know basically like i didn't know where else to go i didn't know who i could trust but i know i can trust you and for some reason that really spoke to me because they had had like a uh, a butting of heads earlier where they, they each had their different philosophies and they were not compatible. And you could tell that, that Nick Fury was just like, I I like you, Cap, and I respect you, but you're a fossil. You know, you don't understand how the world works because you've been sleeping. And Captain America was just like, no, you have been living in this filthy world so much and you're filthy kind of thing. I mean, both of those those views are completely valid. Uh, but then he was just like the one guy I know I can trust is Captain America and so he goes to him I really liked that scene and he goes wife kicked me out you know out of the house again and he's like I didn't know you had a wife and he was saying this for benefit of the people that were listening in and then yeah he is shot several times like in Cap's arms and they spent enough time showing that and showing the doctors trying to do their best that it was just like that they I felt like they had earned it. It was like, okay, they really did kill Nick Fury. Yeah, I thought he really was dead. I actually thought about leaning over and I didn't want to ruin the moment on you because that can happen if you're in a scene, you know, it's it's a really emotional scene or something. I didn't want to lean over and say some wise ass comment right at that moment. So you're just like, Yeah, you're a douche. <laughs> you know? So I didn't say it, but I, th- I thought about leaning over and just being like, so is this the last one on his contract? Because I know that they signed Samuel Jackson to like a nine movie deal. And I just thought, oh, maybe his contract is up then. <laughs> that's, wow, I, I guess that's a way to not have to bother with the next contract. But I would think they would probably still go for it. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, Marvel Studios, th- this is their thing. So they're not going to just kill somebody off. Uh... For no good reason, you know what I mean? Just, oh, contract's up. Okay, you're dead. Um, Because they're planning on making these movies forever. What else are they going to make? They're Marvel Studios. They're not just going to start, you know what? Let's make a teenage drama (laughs) about a girl who finds out she's pregnant and... And it could be one of two boys, because that's really popular. (laughs) And it's an alien. No, no. No, um, (laughs) And it has superpowers. It's a mutant. Uh, no, it's, you know they're not going to do that. This is Marvel Studios. They're going to make Marvel uh, properties into movies, and so they're not going to kill off Nick Fury. I was, I would assume, unless they've decided it's time to go back to white Nick Fury, um, <laughs> and they're going to do that or something. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure that you can ever go back. 
<laughs> now because once anyway uh once you go black you can't go back that's what i was oh that's heading right toward, but i felt it was better eddie left Mur unsaid i think eddie murphy told me that once <laughs> yeah the, the death of nick fury was also helped because we saw the reaction on black widow's face and and maria hill came in and she was emotional and that was neat because maria hill basically for a tiny tiny little uh, comics history lesson Maria Hill was created to be the anti Nick Fury in the comic book. Nick Fury was the guy that was really cool and he always did the right thing and was super tough. And they brought Maria Hill in to be the foil for Nick Fury, the person you could never trust, the person that you, was just always going to uh, be a hard ass and no fun and, and, and make life difficult for the other superheroes. Uh, eventually, Nick Fury was tossed out of S.H.I.E.L.D. and she became director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and she was so unlikable that it was just like, wow. And plus she had a really severe hair. <laughs> but for some reason, I really like Maria Hill in the, the in the Marvel Studios films. That motorcycle guy, he's back. Yeah, from last time. We're in the same park where we did a couple <laughs> episodes last week, except for I'm freezing to death. It was park, very cold. The park last year, we, we didn't. Well, was, we didn't do it It was late early, summer you know. last year. It's still April, unfortunately. Yeah. First week of April, even. But, uh, yeah, Joss Whedon cast... Uh, she's got a terrible name. What's her name? Uh, Colby, Colby, Smol Co Colby Smolders. Colby Smolders as Maria Hill. And uh, she worked... At the very beginning of Avengers, she was sort of a foil for, for Nick Fury in a way. You know, the guy, uh, the person that's going to question whether Nick Fury's orders are, are good or not. But uh, I don't know. They, they they gave her a ton to do in this Captain America movie. I would never have guessed that she would have such a significant part. And she was definitely one of the good guys. And uh, I like that. I, 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 you know, let's see more of her in, in the TV series or in Avengers 2 or whatever it is, you know, she's got going on now. But anyhow, that was one of the reasons why I, I was able to buy it. Because they set aside enough time in the story yeah. to say, okay, you know, this is our goodbye to Nick Fury. You know, there are times when if things are badly done and you you know, okay, well, this is a fake out because if Starbuck were really dying, if so-and-so is really going to die, <laughs> they would dedicate a lot of time to it because this is a significant character. Yeah. And they definitely they definitely did it right with this one. Except for they, did, they didn't kill him. Yeah, well, they so didn't kill him, which that's not a bad thing, I don't think. But No, I'm glad they didn't kill him, but if somebody was like first Coulson mm -hmm. and now Nick Fury, I couldn't argue with that. You could, Comic book death sucks because nobody stays dead. I mean, the best example, the one that's most applicable to what we're talking about is Bucky Barnes, who Stan Lee killed in like 1964 or something like that. And he stayed dead until the friggin' 21st century. Uh, but now, you know, even Bucky is back. And, and you know, part of the, the movie, the, from the title, you'd think that's all this movie would be about. Um, yeah, there was so much more to it. Yeah, I figured it was going to be about that. It was, it, it's kind of surprising because that was the title that it wasn't quite a perfect title for it. I mean, the Winter Soldier was a big part of it. But the Winter Soldier was kind of like the Black Widow of the bad guys, where he was following <laughs> orders, and he just did what he was told. And, you know, when he sees Captain America, oh, he's just a little shaken up, because what's going on? I know that guy. What's what's up? Um, if they had called this Captain America colon 50 Shades of Grey, <laughs> I would have been fine with it. I was just like, well, that's a strange shades choice. <laughs> but Shades of Grey would have been a really good subtitle for this flick. That's what it was about. And yeah, the, the Winter Soldier stuff we haven't really talked about. I was worried when this movie was coming out that the audience wouldn't care about Bucky because he's not that significant a part of the first movie. I mean, and it's, it's not like Cap had years of history in the, uh, in the movies like he did in the comic books of having this kid sidekick right. who was Bucky. But this movie set it up from the very beginning, you know, with Cap going to the Smithsonian and seeing the thing about Bucky, and they they do a flashback with Skinny Steve and, right. and Bucky and all that stuff. I, I, I think they did a good job reminding the audience 
this who Bucky was and why it was important at the beginning of the movie, which is something that they had to do, and I'm very glad that they did it. And another thing that I'm super glad they did, one of my big criticisms for the first Captain America movie was they set up this thing with Peggy Carter. With we, I, You owe me a dan- dance. You know what I'm talking about? Uh-huh. Cap dies, and then he wakes up in the present, and I was just like, okay, the first thing you're going to do is find out, you know, is Peggy alive, and can I still get that dance? I, I don't know if you're still... I, for some reason, I am fixated on the bloody dance. I don't know why. <laughs> but it was that's something that really spoke to me in the first movie. I, I liked that these two were building toward something romantic, and then that got taken away from them. Because, you know, forever, that's out of reach. And and to me, it was just like, wow, that is tragic. That is tragic as 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 losing your life or as tragic as you know, falling into the, the ice or whatever and and you know not getting to see leave it to beaver and things like that and and in the avengers i don't know if you've ever seen the deleted scenes but it initially began with with steve rogers walking through times square and there's all these ads and stuff talking to him and stuff because it's the future where they can say hey customer come on in and we'll get you a brand new tailored suit and all that stuff and and he talks back to it and all that. And he goes to this cafe. He's he's asked Nick Fury for a dossier from S.H.I.E.L.D. And he goes to this cafe and he's reading the, the dossier. And, and everybody is deceased that was part of that Howling Commandos. Except for Peggy Carter. She's still alive. She's living in England, in London. And she's like 91 years old or something like that. And this waitress comes up to him and says, you know, I see you every single day. And, uh, you know, it's like, is there anything that that brings you here and you know you're always reading and uh, is, is there something particular you like here she's obviously flirting and he says uh, no you know it just it seems like a nice place I'm like oh are you just here for the the free wi-fi <laughs> and he goes wireless radio he's trying to figure out what wi-fi could mean and she walks away and this old bastard played by stan lee who's sitting next to him hits him <laughs> and says you should ask for her number you numbskull or something like that and this turns out to be the same waitress that he saves at the end of the Avengers. Oh, right. I loved, loved this opening of the movie. And it was a downbeat, not action opening. But it's just, there was talk last, or two years ago, that maybe we would see an extended cut or a director's cut of the Avengers with a bunch of these scenes that had been cut out. And I really liked that scene. I liked the, the ooh. That is just a chilling sound. I don't suppose people can hear it. The cat howling, yeah, howling it commando so cat. so much like a child, doesn't it? Ugh. It did at first. After uh, it did it enough times, I could tell it was a cat. But anyways, anyway, the first Captain America, I I felt like it had left things unsaid, and maybe that they would have a coda at the very end of the movie, and we would get to see him reunited with an old Peggy Carter. And no, that didn't happen. But at the very beginning of Captain America 2, we did get to see an old Peggy Carter. And there's this brilliant moment where they've been talking and all that, and suddenly her eyes open and she's like, Steve, you're back. You're alive. You're I al- can't believe it. And that was awesome because it was just like she is so old that her mind's not what it used to be. You know, she, She's at the very end of her life, and she's his last link to the past. That really moved me and I really liked that relationship between those two in the first movie and to see it continued it, you know I guess this is the coda I don't suppose we will see another old Peggy Carter scene but uh, right. I, I, I liked that it was another thing carried over from the last movie and, and the power of the sequel is you get to play upon what you have set up in an earlier film right. whether it's jokes or relationships or moments or character things where you don't have to say, hey, this is who this is, this is this, and that is that. So you go, you can just hope that the audience just knows who these characters are and build on that. The best sequels, The Empire Strikes Back of the World, are based on that. It's like, here's what you know, and now we're going to build on that. And the worst sequels are, here's the movie you saw last time again, with not one as good. very, very, very <laughs> slight twist, now there's a and kid. not as good. Yeah, and, and those are the two ways to make sequels. And the, yeah, this one was not 
let's remake Captain America in any way, shape, or form. And uh, anyhow, I, I really liked that, and I liked that when Cap found out who the Winter Soldier was, it was like a punch to the face. It was, you know, it, it had consequences. This Peggy Carter is no longer his only link to the past. And I, I dug that, and can I just jump to the very end? Okay. To be continued next time. The be back. Please, sir, that gets my goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. But you're free to steal it. Okay, now it looks like we're winding down on what we have to say about the movie. So I'm going to finish my story about the hell that we went through to see this film. You already finished. It. I didn't finish. That's the thing. We we saw the movie. We what saw the movie, and the baby fell asleep at 20 minutes before, right? About. Yeah. We came out to the parking lot, and and he was asleep in my arms. He was sleeping right there. I put him into his uh, his chair, okay, his his car seat, and then we closed the door. And I was just gonna talk to you for a minute, and I was talking with you. And I think you got your text from Marshall at the time we were talking, which My I thought was only thing. which I thought was crazy. You must have gone to see like nearly the same showing that we saw. But anyways, all that happens, and then all of a sudden I I hear a noise. I'm like, oh shoot! And I open the door, and he's in here bawling his head off. Because he's woken up and doesn't see me uh, holding his hand or whatever. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, it looks like I got to get out of here because he needs to get home and get to bed. So I got in the car. I said, so long to you. And I took off, headed home. He fell asleep on the way home about halfway there. I pulled in. Took him out of his bed, or sorry, took him out of his car seat, took him to his bed, laid him down, and just about this time, just a little bit after I got home is when my wife had to get up and go to work, sadly. So she's getting up, getting ready for work. I'm laying there, and I'm, I was actually a little alert, more alert than I should be at this time of night. I couldn't sleep right away like I should have been able to. And then all of a sudden we hear a loud noise coming from the other room We're like what was that you hear another banging noise what was that we go out my daughter who spent her evening at the greatest, the greatest party, party ever, ever, ever is now puking all over the floor in her bedroom from this greatest party ever is what i think is the, the cause of this because then to, i actually thought about texting you this after i was done because i thought you'd probably still be up but I wasn't sure if you would or be or not, and I didn't want to wake you up just in case. But yeah, I crashed as soon as I got home because I had to be up early the next day. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I didn't text you just in case I, I it would be disturbing you. But it was about 3 when I went <laughs> to bed because I came home. And, you had to and, clean up the puke? Yeah, she puked in a way so that, like, it was a little bit on the side of her mattress, and then it went down and was, like, jammed in between the bed frame and the and the box spring so it was kind of like mushed in there and i had to pick the box spring up and wipe it off and then wipe off the inside of the bed frame and then of course it was a huge puddle of it <laughs> in, on the carpet itself that i was like scooping it up and it was it was nasty and awful but you've learned the hard way you have to clean up the chunder now. Oh, you can't yeah, yeah. leave it until tomorrow. Yeah, you you got to clean it up or else it's ten times worse to clean up. And it was, yeah, it, it, it was hard to clean up because as I would try and scrape it up, it was full of popcorn kernels. <laughs> Not like the unpopped kernels, but, you know, like the when you bite it and there's a little bit that'll, like, jam up under your gums. Yeah. It was full of that. And so I'd, like, try and wipe it up with the rag and it would just, like, kind of bounce in the air. And then fall back down into the carpet. And I had to get like a vacuum and go over this to just get the popcorn kernels out. <sighs> so, yeah, the, the, the hell that we went through just to get to the movie was not the end of it, unfortunately. I got to go home. It's funny because my wife was jealous. Because she has 
this new schedule. Her new schedule is like even worse than her old schedule used to. She used to have to be at work at like four in the morning. Now she's like, oh, four in the morning. Oh, that was heaven. <laughs> it was so nice to go to work at four in the morning. Because now she's got to be there at like two fifteen, I think, or two thirty at the latest. But I think it's two fifteen. So she gets like no sleep. She's always grumpy. She just has a really hard time uh, with anything. And yeah, she, you know, seven o'clock is like late for getting to bed. She's got to be in bed really early and it doesn't work out well because she's got four children that are noisy. And, and on top of that, she's really sensitive to noise when she's sleeping. So anything will wake her up. So when I told her that I was going to go with you to see Captain America, she was jealous. She's just like, my life sucks. I can't go to see a movie even if I want to because I have to be asleep at 7 o'clock or earlier. She's like, it's not fair that my life is miserable and your life is not miserable. You need to be miserable too. And she was whining at me. And of course it came true! She managed with her curse to make me just as miserable. My one night out of doing something turned into a disaster. But at least we saw the whole movie, so there's that. I can't complain too much. I may have had to clean up a huge pile of chunder and fight with a baby who didn't want to sleep and drive back and forth and back and forth to uh, my house and halfway out to the movie theater and then back again, etc. But I did manage to see the movie, so I can't really complain too much. I was tired the next day, though, I'll have to admit. Because the baby didn't sleep in. You would think if he was up that late, he would sleep in. But no, I think he slept an extra half hour from what he usually does. <sighs> and then here's where we will say thanks for listening.